4,976 people were killed in the first three months of 2021. This is 387 more people killed compared to the corresponding period. Welcome to Unsolved Murders SA, a podcast series where we will be delving into gruesome homicide investigations that, at the time of producing the episodes, were still open. The objective of this series is to keep the stories of the forgotten alive and hopefully help spark a memory for anyone listening in with intimate knowledge of the cases. The views, information or opinions expressed in this series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Swisher Post, its parent company and partners. Before we get into this episode, we'd like to thank you in advance for subscribing to our podcast. Every like, comment and subscription goes a long way in helping us grow our Unsolved Murders SA community. If you're a new listener, then please do us a favor and subscribe to our channel. Unsolved Murders SA is available on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. You can also find the latest updates on South African true crime stories at swisherpost.co.za. The most recent study of child murders in South Africa was published by the University of Cape Town's Children Institute in 2017. The research study assessed violent crimes committed against children aged 0 to 17 years between 2013 and 2017. And according to quantitative data collected and analyzed by Aislinn Delaney and Catherine Hoare, homicide was the second most common cause of death among children in South Africa after respiratory tract infections. In the 2016 2017 calendar year, the child murder rate stood at 4.3 per 100,000 children, with the highest burden of homicide observed in the 15 to 17 year age group. The study also found that homicide cases of children younger than 5 were more likely to be victims of child abuse, usually by someone they knew. Reflecting on their findings, Delaney and Hall concluded that, open quote, information on the relationship of the perpetrator or perpetrators to the child and where these acts occur would provide a better understanding of the context of violence against children in South Africa, close quote. Nobayeti Dube in 2010 published a case study on Ramaphosa two years after the informal settlement made national headlines over xenophobic violence that claimed lives and sowed further divisions in an ethnically segregated community. The settlement was established in the advent of democracy in 1994. Outsiders from the predominantly mixed-race Park community illegally occupied the area of land administered by Ekokoroleni Municipalities Ward 42, and years later were joined by residents of Daviton, others coming from as far out as the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal. The informal settlement was a melting pot of ethnic diversity. People from different cultures and backgrounds with unique belief systems gathered in this once desolate stretch of land and built a community. The area existed without legal access to electricity, water, ablution systems and recreational resources. It wasn't until 2004 that the South African government recognized the inhumane living conditions the people of Ramaphosa endured. However, a mixture of corruption and maladministration only hampered service delivery issues in the region and by 2013, the informal settlement was largely derelict. Apart from rotational load shedding implemented by ESCOM, South Africa's electricity provider, Ramaphosa was synonymous with random and at times prolonged power outages, water shortages, sewage spills and rampant crime. But for its locals, the settlement was a place of refuge for the downtrodden. 
for illegal immigrants from places like Lesotho, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, it was a haven of opportunity. Sipamandla Matikane was 10 years old in 2013. At that age, Matikane had his entire life ahead of him. For his single mother, Nogukanya, Sipamandla was a beacon of his family's future. His sister, Bongiwe Matigane, was 23 years old at the time, and her role was to provide auxiliary support to her mother in raising the young boy. His family described him as a well-mannered and playful kid. His uncle, Sibabalo, adored Spamandla as, open quote, a bright boy, and I was hoping he could make a difference in the family, close quote. Sunday 3 November 2013 was just like any other weekend for Nogokany. It was a relatively warm day and as it had become a norm at the time, there was no electricity in the area of Ramaphosa they lived in. She did not know it at the time, but that Sunday morning and early afternoon were the final moments Nogokanya would spend with her son. The house's cooker needed paraffin, and so Nogukanya and Sipamandla headed to a nearby shop to purchase a refill. On their way, Sipamandla bumped into a group of his friends. This was a common encounter, and Nogukanya thought nothing of it when she said yes to his pleas. He wanted to stay behind and join his friends who were playing at a house near the shop. When Nogukanya turned and walked back home without her son, she had not fathomed that this would be their last encounter. Hours rolled by, and when Sipamandla had not returned home by 7 p.m., the mother knew something was amiss. So, she went looking for her son and his friends. Each boy Sipamandla had been playing with that day was at home by the time Nogukanya came searching for her son, and they all shrugged, claiming to have no clue where the ten-year-old was. Then, one of the boys revealed a crucial detail about the events that had transpired that day that gripped the Matigane family in fear. According to the boy, whose identity was never made public, he and Sipamandla were playing with two other friends when an unknown man approached them. The boy recalled that, at the time, the man had been watching them for a while. He wanted one of the boys to accompany him to a nearby house and ask his girlfriend to come outside. Three of the boys knew better than to entertain strangers, so instinctively they refused the man's offer of five rand. However, Sipamandla could not resist the allure of a quick buck. The boys told the Matigana family that the last time they had seen Sipamandla was when he'd walked off with the man towards the direction of a house they could not identify. Immediately, Nogukanya and her daughter Bongiwe raised their alarm bells. It is important to note that Ramaphosa, a vastly stretched settlement with two extensions, had no basic services like a local clinic or a police station at the time. All municipal and administrative matters were handled by Park authorities, and therefore the police station was on the other side of the township. Nogukanya and Bongiwe contacted the police that evening. A search for the 10-year-old had yielded nothing and they hoped a team of officers would be deployed to assist. There was no electricity in the region on that day and while it is unknown if this was due to load shedding or a power failure, it can be reasonably assumed that the streetlights, if they were installed at the time, were not working. 
The family waited and shockingly, Reiche Park police never came. This would be a hotly contested claim that, in the end, was proven to be true and resulted in a nationwide boycott against the police station. Nomtandaos of Wuma was a neighbor of the Madikanes at the time. Speaking in an interview with Iowa News on 6 November 2013, she recalled how Noko Kanya arrived at her home on Monday at approximately 5.30 a.m. and the pair took a taxi to Reicha Park Police Station to report Spamandla missing. Nomtandaza remembered that Noko Kanya had complained about the police's no-show the day before, but this was never entertained. Instead, according to the neighbor, open quote, after opening the case, the police said they would follow us. We went back home and together with the community started looking for Sipamandl, close quote. At around 10 a.m., the community had already launched its search for the missing 10-year-old and, surprisingly, Reicher Park police had yet to arrive and join the search party. Open quote. At around 10 a.m., when the police had still not arrived, we went again to the police station with the community. Close quote. Nom Tandazo recalled. It was only then, on the second visit, that the Reicher Park station commander deployed one police officer and a sniffer dog to join the search. The morning came and went with no progress made in tracking down Sipamandla. Nathaniel Malerlo was a resident of Ramaphosa and lived a few kilometers away from the Madiganes. That Monday afternoon, he was not aware of the community's search party. He had no idea that a 10-year-old boy had gone missing. With no ablution services available, Malerlo relied on a bushy area near his home to relieve himself. At approximately 2 p.m. that afternoon, he'd made his way to the bushes and before he could get down to business, he stumbled across a horrific sighting that has haunted him ever since. The legs of a small kid were sticking out of the bushes. Completely mortified, Maletlo ran to call for help. He returned to the scene with two local men who contacted police, reporting the discovery of a boy's lifeless body. Police, accompanied by the Madiganes, arrived at the bushy area and very quickly it was determined that the body was that of missing Sipamandla. His pants and underwear were pulled down to his ankles. He had a gaping wound on his neck and a pair of socks were stuffed in his mouth. His body was partially burned too and nearby a used condom was found. This led police to believe that Sipamandla had been sexually assaulted before he was viciously killed. Faced with immense pressure and backlash for their ineptitude, the Gauteng Police Department established a special homicide team of 36 experienced detectives to work on the case and close it swiftly. At the time, the Reicha police had come under fire for the manner in which Sipamandla's missing person report was handled. A day after the gruesome discovery, Gauteng police spokesperson at the time, Captain Tsekiso Mofogeng, criticized Sipamandla's family for only reporting the 10-year-old boy's disappearance on Monday, a day after he was last seen alive. This was obviously not the case, and after an internal inquest, it was determined that the police had failed to respond to the mother's calls for help on that Sunday evening. 
The special task force had to pick up the slack and regain the community's trust by closing in on the man responsible for brutally killing the young boy. Political pressure was also exerted on the task force by the Ekokoroleni municipality. South Africa's presidency and state security minister, Mondli Kungubele, was mayor of the metro at the time, and at every encounter with the media, he made it a point to shine a spotlight on the movements of the investigation. Open quote. This is one of those incidents that sends shivers down his spine, and he has called on the police to find the perpetrators and lock them up as soon as possible. Close quote. His office wrote in a statement at the time. Gungubele was faced with pressures of his own. After all, Sipamandla's death came a month into ongoing investigations into the brutal deaths of four children from Deep Slut, a township situated a little over 50 kilometers from Ramapoz. Zandile and Yonalisa Mali were cousins aged two and three years old, respectively. Their lifeless bodies were discovered in a public toilet cubicle in Deep Slut on the morning of Tuesday, 15 October 2013. The toddlers were reported missing on Saturday, 12 October 2013. Eyewitnesses told police at the time that Zandile and Yonalisa were last seen walking with an unknown man. Post-mortem reports released later on in the investigation revealed that the toddlers had been sexually assaulted before they were strangled to death and later mutilated. DNA samples taken from the toddlers' private parts were tested against a number of suspects and a local man, Ndogozo Hadebe, was identified as a match. His DNA also matched an ongoing child murder case from Deep Sloot. Annelies Amkondo was a five-year-old girl, and just like Sipamandla and the Mali cousins, she too was last seen walking with an unknown man before she disappeared in September 2013. Her mutilated body was found in a garbage bin days later. She too had been raped. A day after the horrific discovery of the Mali cousins, the bodies of two toddlers aged one and three were found on an open field in Katlehong, a little more than an hour's drive from Deep Slut. The children were discovered next to their mother, who was critically injured. It was later determined that their father was responsible for the heinous murders and thus, Ndogoza was never linked as a suspect. Ndogoza was convicted of the murders of Annelisa and the Mali cousins a year later and sentenced to 15 years. He was never linked to the death of Sipamandla, despite the chilling similarities in the manner in which he was lured and killed. Sipamandla's murder investigation failed to pick up steam after his body was discovered. The city of Ekukorleni, as a show of solidarity, handled the finances of the 10-year-old's burial, which was held at the family's home village in the Eastern Cape. Open quote. For us, it's not about the money. It's about making sure that Sipamandla is given a decent bureau and that the family gets enough support. Close quote. The politicking that went on around Sipamandla's case did absolutely nothing to help the investigation. The post mortem report that came out that week confirmed the boy had been strangled to death before he was mutilated and torched. The suspect had made a valiant effort at getting rid of evidence by setting Sipamandla alight, but this gave the special task force little insight into the person they were looking for. 
A year went by with no movement in the homicide case. The Madigane family, with very few resources, tried everything to keep Sipamandla's name alive. On the anniversary of his death, the family, assisted by a leading political party, led a boycott outside Reicha Park police station. At the time, the family accused the police of failing to prioritize the boy's murder case and not communicating on the progress of the investigation. Open quote. Only after calling numerous times were we told last month that there is an investigator working on the case. We asked them why don't they communicate with us and no one can answer us. Close quote. Bongi were exclaimed to reporters during the march. At the boycott, the parents of three-year-old Kerben Levon van Veek were also in attendance. In August 2014, nine months after the death of Sipamandla, Kerben's charred body was found at a mine dump site in Ramaphosa. The toddler was last seen on Wednesday, 6 August 2014, playing outside with his siblings. His charred body was discovered at the mine dump six days later. The parents identified the distinct scar on the toddler's forehead as Kerbin's and DNA tests later confirmed this. The boy according to a post-mortem report, had sustained repeated trauma to his head and was torched. A man named Ntabiseng Katlejo Poku, who was renowned in Ramaphosa by his nickname Chicken, was later identified as a suspect. The glaring similarities in the murder case gave Sipamandla's family hope that Ntabiseng would be linked to their child's death. However, Ntabiseng was never convicted of murdering Kerbin and unfortunately was never tied to Sipamandla's death. Nine years have come and gone without so much as a fresh lead in the ten-year-old boy's case. The last time Sipamandla's mother spoke to the media was in 2015. In an interview with News24, Nogokanya had not lost hope in finding closure. Open quote. I've been praying that Mandla can fight for himself from the grave and show us who killed him. Close quote, she said at the time. Despite our valiant efforts, we were never able to track down Nogokanya. Her son's murder much like many homicide cases in South Africa, remains unsolved. If you were listening to this episode and happen to have information that could help investigators, please contact SAPS's toll-free Crime Stop number at 08600 10 This brings us to the end of our episode. Thank you for listening.